Hey everybody, welcome to the third video in my home brewing series. In our last video, I showed you how I ferment and keg all of my beers. And in that video, I briefly showed you both my fermentation chamber and my kegerator here. But I thought it would be a good idea to take a closer look at both of these units. So that way, if you're looking into building a fermentation chamber or a kegerator, maybe this video will give you some ideas on how to do so. So I'm actually getting ready to keg the chocolate stout that we brewed back in our first video of this series. But before we do that, why don't we go head over to the fermentation chamber and take a look at how I have everything set up. So here we are at my fermentation chamber, and there's really not a whole lot to this one. As you can see, it's just a simple chest freezer that I picked up from Home Depot. It's large enough to fit two fermenters inside, and really there aren't that many modifications that I made to the chest freezer itself for this one. The main component that we're going to use for this chest freezer is actually going to be the temperature controller that we have this freezer plugged into, so why don't we go take a closer look at that. So the primary purpose of this fermentation chamber is to try to keep the beers at a steady temperature as they are fermenting. This is especially important during the early stages of fermentation where the beers tend to warm up a bit due to the vigorous yeast activity inside the fermenter. In order to maintain a constant temperature inside the fermentation chamber, I have the chest freezer plugged into an external temperature controller, which you can see here. I'm using a Johnson Controls A419 for this chamber, and I'll quickly show you the settings that I'm using for my fermentation chamber. First, let me walk you through how I have everything connected. So the freezer has a standard electrical plug coming out of the back, which you can see here, but rather than plugging the freezer directly into the wall, I have plugged it into a port that is connected to the temperature controller. The temperature controller has its own standard plug that is then plugged into the wall. If you look at the left side of the unit, you can see a gray wire coming out, and that is for the temperature probe. This temperature probe will send a signal to the controller to tell it what the current temperature is. If the temperature is too high based off of the settings we adjust, then the temperature controller will send power to the freezer to run the compressor and allow the freezer to begin cooling. The controller will then shut off the compressor once the temperature probe signal reaches our desired fermentation temperature. So you can see that I run the wire for the temperature probe up the back side of the freezer and it comes in through the lid. Then I secure the temperature probe on the fermenter itself in order to get a reading from the carboy. I'll usually use a napkin like the one you see here to provide a little insulation, so that way the reading is primarily coming from the fermenter. As the beer warms up during fermentation, especially during the early stages of fermentation, the temperature controller can react quickly to those temperature swings. Now let's take a closer look at the settings we can adjust for our temperature controller. When you first look at the controller, the number you will see is the current temperature that the temperature probe is reading inside the freezer. So right now, it's 61 degrees Fahrenheit inside my chest freezer. In order to cycle through our different settings, you can use the menu and arrow buttons. The first operation we're going to look at is set point, or SP. This is going to be your target fermentation temperature that you want your fermentation chamber to hold at. To set your desired set point, use the menu and arrow buttons until you see SP on the screen, then hit the menu button again. The flashing number will show your current set point, so you can see that my fermentation chamber is set to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. To change the set point, use the arrow keys until your desired fermentation temperature is reached. Then, simply hit the menu button to return back to the main screen and your set point is set. Next, we're going to talk about differential, or DIF. You can see that my differential is set to 3 degrees Fahrenheit. Depending on how your temperature controller is wired, which is something I'll show you in just a little bit, the differential will allow you to set an acceptable range between when the controller allows the freezer to run the compressor. For my setup, with a set point of 65 degrees Fahrenheit and a differential of 3 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature controller is going to run the compressor once the temperature probe reads 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 3 degrees higher than my set point. The controller will then shut off the compressor once the temperature probe reads my set point of 65 degrees Fahrenheit. You may be thinking, why not set a lower differential to maintain a more constant temperature? This is certainly a good idea in theory, but having a narrow differential would cause the compressor to run more often, which will greatly shorten the lifespan of your fermentation chamber. So I like to give my freezer a little buffer to prevent the compressor from cycling too often. Now let's look at ASD, or Anti-Short Cycle Delay. ASD is a safety measure that the temperature controller uses to prevent the freezer from cycling too often, similar to what we just talked about with our differential. As you can see, I have my ASD set to 12 minutes, which is the highest number you can set this unit to. 
What this means is that once the controller turns off the compressor, at least 12 minutes will have to pass before the controller will allow the compressor to turn on again, regardless of what temperature is read by the probe. So I have my ASD maxed out in order to ensure that my compressor doesn't burn out too quickly. Now for the last two settings, I actually leave everything at default. OFS stands for offset. This is used if you would need a secondary set point, which is something that I have never needed. And the last setting is SF or sensor failure operation. I leave mine set to one, which means the controller will implement a one minute delay before initiating failure response. This is primarily used in industrial applications to allow maintenance personnel to verify what the failure is with the unit before annoying failure indicators go off. But this doesn't really apply to this fermentation chamber setup. So there are two ways that the temperature controller operates to cool your fermentation chamber relative to your set point. Cooling cut in or cooling cut out. You can change how your temperature controller operates by adjusting two small jumpers inside the controller. To access these jumpers, you'll want to make sure that your temperature controller is not plugged into anything. Then remove the front screws and gently open the enclosure box. Now you can just barely see these jumpers that you can adjust here, and you should refer to the manual to see how to have the jumpers set in order to have the controller cool the way you want. I have my jumpers set to the cooling cutout position. What this means is that the temperature controller will run the compressor once the temperature probe reads the upper limit set by my differential. The controller will then cut out by shutting off the compressor once the temperature probe reaches my set point. You can also have the jumper set to the cooling cut in position. In this configuration, the temperature controller will cut in once your set point is reached and run the compressor until the temperature is lowered to the lower limit that you have set by your differential. So if I leave all of my settings the same, this means that my freezer will turn on at 65 degrees Fahrenheit and will turn off at 62 degrees Fahrenheit. Obviously, you could get the same results with both configurations, but it's important to have your jumpers set properly in order to know how they will affect your set point and differential. Now finally, once you have your jumpers adjusted, simply replace the front cover, tighten the screws, plug everything in, and then you're good to go. And that pretty much covers everything with my fermentation chamber. Before you do use one of these temperature controllers, do be sure to read the instruction manual that comes with it, as it will have very important information on what the different settings do as well as have diagrams for how to have your jumper set in order to properly maintain temperatures inside your fermentation chamber. So I'm gonna really quick go keg my chocolate stout and then afterwards I'll give you a quick tour of my kegerator as well. All right, well I got my chocolate stout all kegged up. So why don't we take a closer look at my kegerator here. Now the base for my kegerator is the very same chest freezer that I'm using for my fermentation chamber. But as you can see, I have built a little bit around it to make it look like a nice piece of furniture. Now the chest freezer is able to just barely fit four or five gallon kegs and I'm able to connect a tap to each one of those kegs. Now having a nice kegerator like this was one of the driving factors that led me to switch from bottling to kegging because now if I want a nice glass of draft beer, I can simply walk over here, grab a glass, and then pour myself a pint. So this is my Hefeweizen that I brewed earlier. It's not fully carved up yet, but it is getting pretty close, so why don't we quick take a look at it. So you can see that the Hefeweizen is very pale. It's definitely not fully carbonated yet. Uh, we do have some nice bubbles inside, but it's not giving us a nice foamy head quite yet. So probably another three or four days and we'll be at full carbonation, but we can go ahead and give it a taste now. Mm. It's very light and it's got a very nice banana flavor, so I really like that. I think this one is going to come out really good once it's done carbonating. And I'm also very excited to try the chocolate stout when it's finished as well. So this style of kegerator is actually called a coffin keezer, and that's because we're using a freezer rather than a refrigerator. But I still call it a kegerator because I like that word much better. If you're interested in building a kegerator in this style, I don't have any videos really showing how I built it, but I did take a lot of photos throughout the building process. So I'll put a link for an album containing all of those pictures down in the description below. So be sure to check that out if you're interested. Now again, as you can clearly see, I have four taps for this kegerator. Now this fourth tap here, I actually use exclusively for sodas because Lisa doesn't really drink that much. Right now I have a five gallon keg of root beer that we made and it's extraordinarily delicious. Now the thing with sodas is that they require a significantly higher amount of CO2 than beers. So I need to have a way to send a higher amount of CO2 to my fourth keg and maintain a lower pressure for my remaining three beer kegs. So why don't we take a closer look at the kegerator and I'll show you how I have my regulator set up and how I have everything connected. 
Before we jump inside, let's take a look at the outside of the kegerator. Like I said before, I have four taps. The first tap here is being used for my Hefeweizen, and the second tap here will be used for my chocolate stout. The fourth tap is where I dispense homemade sodas. I don't have anything connected to my third tap right now. I'm actually thinking about brewing a nut brown ale in the near future, so be sure to subscribe as I'm likely to record a brew along video for that. You can also see that the tap box has some LEDs. You can use this remote control to change the colors of the LEDs like so. You can do solid colors, rainbow effects, and several other options. Personally, because my favorite color is purple, I like to keep my LEDs purple with a fading effect. Also outside of my kegerator, in a pretty unorganized mess, is my temperature controller. Even though it looks a little different, I'm using the same temperature controller as my fermentation chamber, just with different settings. My set point is dialed in to 38 degrees Fahrenheit with a differential of 2 degrees. All other settings are the same, including where I have my jumpers placed. I also have my CO2 tank and pressure regulator here as well. This main regulator is used to determine how much pressure is being sent from the CO2 tank to the kegs inside the kegerator. This regulator has two gauges. The gauge on the left will show you how full your CO2 tank is, so you can know when you need to get it refilled. The second gauge will show you how much pressure you are sending into the kegerator. If we take a closer look, we can see that I have my pressure set to 30 psi. This is because, like I had said before, the fourth tap is used for sodas, which requires a significantly higher pressure level than beer. So with my main regulator set to 30 psi, let's take a look inside the kegerator to see how I split the lines to send a higher pressure to one keg and a lower pressure to the rest. First you can see that the main line from the CO2 tank runs behind the kegerator and is sent to a two-way manifold that is mounted inside the wooden enclosure. This manifold will allow me to send my CO2 to two different lines. The valve on the right is getting sent directly to the kegerator through the tap box, allowing me to send 30 psi to one of the kegs. The valve on the left is going to a secondary pressure regulator that you can see here. Now this regulator is taking that 30 psi and reducing it to somewhere between 10 to 12 psi, which is a pretty good pressure for most styles of beer. Now you can certainly use multiple secondary regulators to dial in specific pressures for different styles of beer, but for me, I like to keep things simple and I'm fine with using the same pressure across all of the beers that I brew. If we look at the back of the kegerator, we can see both the high and low pressure CO2 lines running into the tap box. I also have some electrical cables coming out of the back that are used to power my LEDs and some computer fans that you'll see inside. So why don't we open up the tap box and take a peek inside. Now it's a bit tight in here, so I can't get the greatest camera angles, but I'll try my best here. First, let's follow those two CO2 lines. You can see both lines coming into the tap box here. The line on the top is the lower pressure line from the secondary regulator, and the line on the bottom is the high pressure line. The high pressure line is going straight down into the kegerator to the kegs where the hose will be connected to my soda keg. Then the low pressure line is sent to a three-way manifold that I have mounted inside the tap box. This allows me to split the low pressure line into three different lines, all of which are sent into the kegerator to connect to the three remaining beer kegs. Now you'll notice that I tried to insulate the tap box with some insulation foam, and you can also see that I have two computer fans running inside the tap box as well. This is because you want to try to keep your beer lines as cold as possible, or the temperature change may cause your beers to foam too much when you're pouring. So I had cut additional holes through the lid, and I mounted these computer fans to circulate cold air from the freezer into the tap box. This fan is directed to bring the cold air from the freezer into the tap box, and this fan is mounted upside down to circulate it back into the freezer, creating a continuous cold air current. The last things in my tap box are a power adapter for the LEDs, and you can also see the backs of the four taps here as well. Now one thing to note is with this style of kegerator, especially with all of the tile work that we've put in, it's actually very heavy when you lift the lid, so you want to be very careful when doing so. Now I needed to find a way to keep the lid open, especially when I'm moving kegs in and out, because I'm not able to keep one hand on the lid and then use my second hand to move the heavy keg in and out. What I've done is I'm able to lift the kegerator open like so, and then I actually keep a two by four here, and I'm able to just keep it propped open just like this. So why don't we come on closer and take a quick peek inside the kegerator. Inside the kegerator, I am just barely able to fit four five gallon kegs. If we look at the top of the kegerator, we can see the three holes that were drilled out. The two holes on the side are for the computer fans to circulate the cold air into the tap box, and the hole in the center is where I run all of my CO2 and beer hoses through. 
Now, speaking of beer hoses, it is very important to make sure that your hoses are properly sized. If your hoses are too short, you may get foamy pores when you open your taps, and if the hoses are too long, it'll just take forever to pour even a single pint. So for my setup, all of my beverage hoses have an inner diameter of 3 16ths of an inch, which is pretty standard for most beverage lines. Because my three beer lines have a lower pressure of 10 to 12 PSI, I found that 10 feet of hose works pretty well. However, for my soda keg, I'm actually using about 30 feet of hose because this keg requires a much higher pressure, which you can see coiled here on the side. You can also see the temperature probe coming in from the back of the kegerator. I have this probe sitting in a small container filled with water, which just helps to minimize a rapid change of temperature when I open the kegerator when I'm changing out my kegs. The last thing I have inside my kegerator is a small Eva Dry dehumidifier. I found that I get a good bit of condensation in my kegerator over time, so I use this dehumidifier to try to minimize that. I like using this Eva Dry dehumidifier because it uses silica gel to remove moisture from the air, and it has little indicator beads to let you know when the silica gel is too wet to absorb any more moisture. You can't really see it too well, but when the beads are orange, it means the silica gel is still dry and is able to absorb moisture. But once they turn dark blue, it means that they are too wet to absorb any more moisture. Then you can simply plug this dehumidifier into a standard outlet and the silica gel will heat and dry out, allowing you to reuse it again and again. So that's how my kegerator works. Now I do have the keg of chocolate stout here and it's ready to go inside the kegerator. So I thought I would show how I do get everything connected. When using a kegerator this style, you do want to be very careful when opening this lid because it can be very top heavy and is prone to tipping over, so you do want to be aware of that. Now in that last video, I talked about how I flush all of the lines with both cleaner and sanitizer before filling it, so I'll show you how I do that real quick. This keg does have beer in it right now, so I'm not going to actually go through the full cleaning process, but basically what I will do is I'll keep this keg outside and I'll take my beverage line connected to the keg and then I'll also take a CO2 line and I'll connect it to the keg as well. If you do plan on doing something like this you want to make sure that your lines are long enough to run outside of the keg. Then in order to pour I'll actually take my 2x4 and put it on its side and that way I'm able to partially close the keg and access all of my taps here. Then when it's time to put the keg into the kegerator, I will simply take the keg, carefully place it inside, and then get all of my hoses connected. And there we go. All that's left to do is close it up. And now this keg is ready to pour. Last thing I'll do is push it back to the wall where it belongs. And there we go, our beer is kegged up and ready to serve. We just have to wait for a couple of weeks to come to its full carbonation level and then we're good to go. And that's how I set up my fermentation chamber and my kegerator. If you're looking into building your own fermentation chamber or kegerator and have any questions, be sure to leave me a comment below and I'll try to answer as best as I can. Do be sure to give this video a thumbs up as that will be greatly appreciated. And if you haven't yet, definitely make sure that you're subscribed to the channel and hit that notification bell icon. I'm planning on recording two more videos for this series. First off, once the chocolate stout here is fully carbonated, I'm planning on releasing a video where I taste both of those beers and tell you how they turn out. And then I'm also planning on recording another brew along video where I'll be making another beer to fill this third tap here. For this one, I'm planning on recording another instructional style video, but making it a little bit more condensed and beginner friendly. But that's all I have for this video. Thank you all so much for the support so far with this series. I've really enjoyed making these home brewing videos and it's really nice returning to a hobby that I haven't done in a very long time, especially when you make delicious brews like these. And until next time guys, Cheers.